And there we go. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Preservation New Jersey's free virtual series, Talks with Our Ten Most. Right off the bat, please note that, as I just said, this evening's event is being recorded. So please keep yourself on mute until we get to the Q&A at the end, at which point you'll all have the power to unmute yourselves and ask questions if you would like. Now, um, forgive me as I go into some housekeeping here. If you're a regular attendee of our virtual programs, the spiel will sound very familiar, so forgive me, but I am Melissa Ziobro, the Director of Public History at Monmouth University in West Long Branch, but for this event tonight, I am wearing my Preservation New Jersey board member hat. Um, I am tonight's host, but I want to give some quick recognition to our very hardworking Executive Director Kelly, who is on the Zoom, and our President Paul, who I don't see just yet, but we might hear from later, <laughs> and our office coordinator, Dale, and our education committee chair, Mark, and everybody else um, at PNJ who works so hard, um, most of the folks volunteering their time to make this organization run. So um, thanks to all of my teammates here at PNJ. If you're not familiar with Preservation New Jersey, if you just stumbled across this link, just a little bit about the organization. It was founded in 1878, 1878. We're not quite that old, 1978. <laughs> and it's a statewide membership organization, a nonprofit devoted to historic preservation. So we are interested in promoting economic vitality, sustainability, and heritage of New Jersey's diverse communities through advocacy and education. You can learn more about what we do and how you can get involved on our website. It's preservationnewjersey.org. If you haven't looked at our website in a while, please check it out because Kelly's done a wonderful overhaul of it recently. Preservation New Jersey is perhaps best known for its 10 most endangered historic places in New Jersey list, which draws attention to remarkable sites and their many challenges. We hope that listing potentially endangered sites on this list is a catalyst for change and positive solutions that might save them. We also publish instructional and informative toolkits and other educational materials we maintain an informative newsletter, we have an active social media presence, and more. We have a number of exciting events coming up um, this Saturday at 9 a.m. You can join us at Monmouth University in West Long Branch for our annual public meeting. We'll have some light refreshments. We will have an update on all the goings on of PNJ, what we've been up to in the past year and what we have lined up for the year ahead. We'll have a presentation from one of our 2023 10 most sites, the Joseph Murray Farmhouse and Barn, wonderful Revolutionary War site right in Monmouth County. So we hope you'll join us for that. At the conclusion of our formal program, we'll also invite you to take self-guided tours of Monmouth University's two national register listed buildings, the Great Hall and the Guggenheim Memorial Library. So it's going to be a great day this Saturday at Monmouth University for our annual meeting, and we hope we'll see you all there. Looking ahead a bit more, um, in November, our virtual program will be a Q&A with PNJ focused on recruiting boards for your historical societies, uh, small museums, etc. And then at the end of November, we will have our Historic Preservation Awards event. That's going to be November 30th at Masker's Barn in Berkeley Heights. Uh, looking ahead even further, we've got an exciting calendar for 2024 shaping up. So again, we hope you will get involved and you can find more information on our website, preservationnewjersey.org. So on to tonight's program. Um, some of you know that Preservation New Jersey ventured into virtual programming during the pandemic, as so many organizations did. 
but we've kept up with it as a nice and relatively low cost way to reach people in the comfort of their own homes. So we started with our Q&A with PNJ series, and then we added this series, Talks with Our 10 Most, which is intended to reach back to sites that were previously listed on our 10 Most Endangered Sites list. And just see how they're doing, touch base with them, help to promote them, and see if they have any lessons learned for others who might be struggling to save <clears throat> a historic site. So today, we are going to be focusing on the Anchor Cafe in Perth Amboy, which was listed as a 10 most site in 2022. We are sitting down with Mark, who I mentioned earlier uh, is a PNJ board member and our education programs committee chair. But today he, we all wear a lot of hats around here. Today he is wearing his Middlesex County Division of Historic Sites and History Services hat to talk to us about the Anchor Cafe. Mark's going to start by talking about the terracotta industry in Perth Amboy broadly to provide some historic context and then get into the case study of the Anchor Cafe. Um, after Mark provides some prepared remarks, we will have plenty of time for questions from the audience. So hold those questions to the end and Mark will be ready for you. All right, Mark, that was a lot of preamble, a lot of context there. Are you ready to dive in? I am, yes. Awesome. <laughs> the floor is all yours. All right. Thank you, uh, Melissa, um, and for being such a force also with uh, Preservation New Jersey, helping to organize all of these uh, wonderful uh, programs. Um, and I, I do, before I dive in here uh, and get started, um, I, I want to recognize, so John Dyke, who is the Perth Amboy City historian, uh, is on. Um, and uh, John, just I, I have a, a presentation here. And uh, it's welcome to jump in and, and help um, with the conversation uh, as well. Um, John is a uh, tremendous advocate for Perth Amboy history um, and for the preservation of historic buildings and is one of the again, the Keystone people behind uh, the Anchor Cafe. Uh, I also wanna recognize um, Renee Skelton, who's from the uh, Perth Amboy Historic Preservation Commission and the work that she, along with the commission, uh, are doing to help um, preserve buildings in Perth Amboy and to uh, um, kind of understand the, the scope of these historic buildings that have architectural terracotta in them or made out of architectural terracotta and how uh, they can be um, preserved. Um, and finally, also do, do want to recognize, I know Melissa mentioned this, the work of our executive director, Kelly Raffel, uh, doing a tremendous job here with PNJ. So I, I'll, I'll dive in um, first, uh, giving kind of a, a, a broad overview of um, the ceramic history uh, in Middlesex County. Um, the, the Anchor Cafe building itself, one of the things that's so great about it is it's just dripping with architectural terracotta ornamentation. And it's not within a vacuum that that was done. It's part of a story of the architectural terracotta industry in Perth Amboy. Um, and when you take another step back, it's part of a larger story of the ceramic history in um, in Middlesex County and in central New Jersey. Uh, Middlesex County is part of the Raritan Clay Formation. It's this very ancient bed of clay that runs underneath um, parts of, uh, of the county. In fact, it starts off in Mercer County down near Trenton, kind of comes up through the central part of the state. And when you get over into communities like Woodbridge, and South Amboy and um, uh, Perth Amboy and Edison, uh, that vein of clay comes near the surface and it made it very easy historically to dig down and to mine that clay for the production of ceramics. And we're going to be focusing in with the Anchor Cafe with architectural terracotta, but that particular use of clay um, 
is part again of a larger use of the production of stoneware, of bricks, uh, of uh, tile, um, and uh, other ceramic products that were being produced in Middlesex County because of the accessibility of the veins of clay that ran through uh, the central part of New Jersey. Some of the earliest production of uh, and the use of clay was in the production of, uh, of stoneware. In fact, um, much of Middlesex County was in the cradle, in the cradle of American stoneware production. And um, this is a, an image of a um, stoneware jug uh, reputed to have been made by Abiel Price of South Amboy. And uh, it was sold recently. There's this wonderful stoneware auction house called appropriately named Crocker Farm Auctions. And they have auctions um, throughout the year where they deal with ceramics and they have wonderful stoneware uh, ceramics that they sell through this auction house, including a lot of New Jersey uh, early pieces that have come up. Um, and this has just a wonderful, you know, square rigged sailing vessel uh, in this cobalt blue decoration um, uh, with, you know, these wonderful intact handles on it. And although this is very decorative, this type of stoneware, this was really the Tupperware of the 19th century. You know, this was was mainly utilitarian pieces that were used for the storage of, uh, in some cases, alcohol, um, or they had large open mouth crocks, which they would use for pickling or preserves. Um, this piece sold at auction, um, and I hope we're all sitting down when I reveal the price. Uh, it was sold for two hundred and fifty-two thousand uh, dollars recently at this Crocker Farm auction, and it also shows, you know, just how much th these pieces of really what's kind of an American folk style um, are in demand by collectors uh, uh, today. Uh, so, if by chance you're at a garage sale and you see something like this on the dollar table, uh, give me a call and I I'll come down and I'll I'll, I'll pick it up. Uh, so, as I mentioned, uh, there are these veins of clay that uh, run through uh, central New Jersey. When you get over near Raritan Bay, uh, there are these bluffs overlooking the uh, the bay where some of these veins of clay come out. And these were some yeah, of the earliest yeah, areas. Yes, go ahead, John. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just to add on to what you're saying, you're absolutely right. About 21,000 years ago, the Wisconsin Glacier stopped right here in Perth Amboy. And in our subsoil, we have this really rich blue-gray clay that you saw in the stoneware piece that was made in South Amboy. And we have a lot of that in our subsoil. Anybody who's done archaeology in Perth, the Amboy has run into that great clay. Yeah, and you know, John, you you, you give a, a great description of it, right? When, when, when you see it in the raw, like in the wild, as you, as you dig through it, it really is this wonderful uh, gray, bluish body right. um, uh, clay that, uh, you know, fires up into, uh, you know, depending on what temperature it's fired at, uh, can produce um, uh, or produce much of that stoneware, that early stoneware. Um, so just across Raritan Bay from Perth Amboy, this is an image of the waterfront in South Amboy from 1827. It shows the home of, um, of uh, Samuel Gordon, one of the early settlers there. Uh, in the background, not the way background with the, the artist um, uh, uh, rendition of the mountains there, but come forward and the, the sort of, you can see the bluff, the, the greenish hills uh, that are behind there where some of that clay uh, came out that John just mentioned. And that was mined very early. These were some of the early areas where clay mining took place. They would dig it out of these embankments, bring it down to the waterfront, load them onto vessels. You see one very similar there, a sloop um, that's docked along the waterfront there. And the clay itself was used by potters uh, along the eastern seaboard. In fact, in New York City, there were a number of early potters as well that were uh, producing stoneware made out of Middlesex County clay that was transported there. And this is the area that it came from, Perth Amboy, uh, South Amboy, uh, Woodbridge, and uh, Edison as well. What changes and what shifts here is the earliest ceramic uh, history, it, it's a cottage industry. Um, but during the Industrial Revolution, like it, it explodes into this mass production of, of uh, ceramic goods. And 
not just architectural terracotta, but again, bricks, like in Sayreville, the entire town of Sayreville was based on the Sayer and Fisher Brick Company um, and different kinds of bricks, enamel bricks, common bricks, face brick, pressed brick, uh, tiles as well, all kinds of different types of tile. Um, and of course, the architectural terracotta industry as well. Uh, this here is a view of Atlantic uh, terracotta in Perth Amboy at the head of uh, Buckingham Street. Um, and you can see all the kilns where they would fire the, uh, the, the clay to turn it into you know, vitreous material um, that was durable and could stand the weathering. And um, you know, what a sight the, you know, these must have been to see these kilns you know, kind of belching their, uh, their smoke out of them, uh, stuffed full of, of, of architectural terracotta being fired um, in something like this. And many of these factories uh, were also worked, and we should recognize too, the immigrant populations that had come into places like Perth Amboy uh, to work uh, and do the labor intensive tasks there. That, that's right, Mark. Uh, what you're showing there, the Atlantic Terracotta Company, prior to that, it was the Perth Amboy Terracop terracotta company and prior to that it was alfred hall and sons in about 1873 alfred hall and his nephew william hall decide to dedicate uh you know a part of their brick making company to making architectural terracotta yeah and, and you can uh, see here uh, at one time this one particular company had over 20 kilns uh on the site yeah, it, just it's a it's a tremendous image, uh, and as John mentioned too, the, the build on that Alfred Hall, an Englishman, had come over um, with some knowledge of the ceramic industry, uh, you know, as John mentioned, and you know began the production of uh, ceramic products here in Middlesex County in Perth. Amboy, James and Taylor, uh, right? Uh, James Taylor, uh, not not the singer, <laughs> but the um, father of the American terracotta uh, industry. He actually started in Perth Amboy also at the Eagleswood site, previously known as Raritan Bay Union, with the founder's son, Edward Spring, and they found the, the Eagleswood art pottery. So what, what exactly is architectural terracotta? Um, Architectural terracotta is a it's a it's a molded architectural design in clay that's been fired. Um, it is a it's a cladding that's applied to the facade of uh, of structures. Um, this is a photograph of the Woolworth Building, um, which was the largest building in the world when it was completed, or the tallest building in the world when it was completed uh, around uh, the nineteen teens or tens. Um, it's made from, John, you want to go ahead and mention uh, where all this terracotta was well, produced? Well, all the terracotta came from the uh, Perth Amboy Terracotta Works, also uh, later known as the Atlantic Terracotta Works. And it was it's a great building. It was the tallest building at its time. The president of the United States turned on the lights when the building was first dedicated. And it was just shipped uh, to New York via railroad and via the Arthur Kill and uh, some roadways as well to New York City from Perth Amboy. Yeah, it's this wonderful sort of neo-Gothic design. Um, it looks like, a, you know, a, it's a, its own sort of cathedral style uh, as well. Uh, I had the opportunity a number of years ago to go inside the building. Um, they have a, a, a very serious restoration plan where they go over the facade. And if there are elements that are deteriorating or in danger of detaching uh, and falling and causing havoc, they will um, they will replace them. And they, uh, they actually have molds uh, in the basement, um, as well as some of the original terracotta pieces that were removed and replaced with replica pieces uh, as well. Uh, so it was a neat experience to actually walk through uh, this space and talk to the people that manage how they deal with um, the exterior of the building and making sure that it's um, uh, it's safe. And, you know, what do you do then when you have to replace some of the, the terracotta that's deteriorated? Basically, it's a steel frame building with uh, terracotta just uh, uh, attached right to it. One of the problems that Mark talked about replacing some of the terracotta on this building when the architect designed the building they didn't take into quite quite the proper expansion and contraction rates so some of the terracotta as mark had mentioned was damaged and cracked over the years from expansion and contraction so they've had to replace it 
And John, that, that's a great point too, right? So if you take, if you strip all the terracotta off of this structure, it's you'll a, have the, the steel skeleton. It's a steel uh, frame building, exactly. Yeah. And terracotta is just a sheet on it, kind of like think of a aluminum siding in your home or shingling your home. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Um, so these are some items that we have in our museum collection. I'll give you a link later on to where you can access uh, more material that the county has on the um, terracotta industry. Uh, these are photographs of modelers in Atlantic uh, at Atlantic Terracotta. Uh, it could be a cladding, you know, as we we uh, we talked about with the Woolworth building, but they could also create, you know, sort of these sculptural elements that were part of the building as well. And you see here uh, an image. And if you look at the gentleman. Uh, on the top there, uh, if you look on his uh, his left hand, you'll see one of the sculpting pieces that was used. They they would model first out of clay to take the molds from, um, and so there was a a modeling department um, with folks that had you know great artistic skill to create these pieces um, that you know then would be translated into molds, and then those molds would be packed and then glazed and fired in the kilns. They also use special rulers. If you look down at the bottom um, where the gentleman, there's a ruler that's there. Because terracotta shrinks when you fire it, uh, the, the rulers were calibrated a little bit larger to allow for uh, the shrinkage in the kiln when they uh, when they fired these pieces. So Perth Amboy, um, and we'll, we'll talk about some of the buildings in Perth Amboy that have architectural terracotta. Perth Amboy is a tree when it comes to architectural terracotta. And the Anchor Cafe is, you know, part of that, um, you know, part of that treat there. Uh, Perth Amboy just has a number of unique buildings with architectural terracotta on them. Uh, and part of that is because of, you know, the location, the people that produce it, it's kind of uh, uh, seeping its way into the, the streetscape in Perth Amboy. Uh, this is an example and, and we of- had and we had five terracotta industries, separate industries within the city of Perth Amboy. Yeah, and John, this this building is, uh, is this uh, Smith Street? Street? Yeah, it's, it's a great example of polychrome terracotta. And uh, some of that technique was developed at uh, Perth Amboy terracotta and Atlantic terracotta, where they could fire multiple pieces with different glazes. Yeah, and... Um... The terracotta progresses, as John mentioned, this is polychrome. So it's it's various glazing and coloring uh, to achieve this, you know, this beautiful look here. And, and there are some, you know, some spectacular colors there. The earliest terracotta from the 1880s uh, period, a little bit earlier, was often a buff colored or reddish color. Uh, that was the, uh, depending on the type of clay and what it was fired to, that was the final um, uh, color that resulted from that. Later, they start applying glazing uh, to it, um, often in kind of a monochrome glaze. But by the 1910s period, they were developing with very colorful uh, glazing, as you see here. Uh, again, some unique, this is the, is this the Massapus building? Massapus building on State Street, correct. Yeah, you can see over the garage, and actually the, the coping on the top is terracotta, but over the top of the garage is a, is an automobile jutting out the top of the garage. On the radiator, it says 1916. Um, it's hard to see, but there's two driver or a driver and a passenger with uh, goggles on and you know scarfs around uh, as though they're they're racing out the top of this building. Um, it's one of only two that I know of, unless, John, unless you know others. The, the other one I know of is up in New Haven, Connecticut, um, but it's a it's a real unique one of a kind or at the Skatova kind pieces uh, that are out there. Many of these pieces were specifically made for a, a, an industry. And this particular one was a car dealership and a, and a car repair place. And um, again, maybe you might have two pieces as Mark said, but in many cases, this architectural artistic terracotta, there is only one piece made. Um, another one of a kind, like, and th this has got so much wrapped up into it. Um, this is, uh, and John, correct me if I'm wrong, it's a savings and loan building that's across from a Russian Orthodox church. Yes. Um, and uh, I mean, here you have something that just speaks of, of an immigrant population. Uh, America, the Statue of Liberty, uh, the, the Russian Orthodox cross, right? All like wrapped into this one imagery on the front facade of a building. 
Lady Liberty has, or at one time had an electric light bulb uh, up on the top there uh, as well. Um, but it just, it's such a unique, again, one of a kind piece um, with some polychroming. You can see clearly with the flag. Uh, the terracotta industry largely goes into decline before the Second World War. There's shifting tastes in architectural um, styles. Uh, in Perth Amboy, it hangs on a little bit longer. Um, Federal Seaboard Terracotta Corporation was one of the last terracotta companies right. um, to close, what, 1968, was Eight. it? 1968 was the last year they fired, and they went bankrupt a year later. Uh, they produced... Uh, different a different type of terracotta if you look at this you know modern um building from the 1960s uh the the front facade of it that um kind of uh paneling there is made out of a very thin veneered uh terracotta um some historians have called this the age of terrible cotta I, I don't know i mean i think it's you know it's gaining a following and an understanding of its time frame uh, but it shows you the shift in architectural styles and how some of these companies were trying to keep up with that shifting taste. And ultimately they, you know, they couldn't. So uh, in addition to buildings, what's great about Perth Amboy is it has all these other types of things that can be seen. Um, John, you want to talk about the Washington statue? Yes, this was, uh, this was uh, made at New Jersey Terracotta Company, which later becomes Federal Seaboard Terracotta off of Fall Avenue in Perth Amboy. It goes to uh, 1896, uh, was sculpted. Uh, it's a one of a kind piece. And the costs were paid by the Danish community and immigrant community in Perth Amboy. And many of the Danes actually ran the terracotta industries in Perth Amboy. But what's interesting about the terracotta, I mean, you take a look at some of these pieces and people think that they are uh, a Danish or Italian or a Polish. And yes, all those different people were artistic designers. But one of the main designers was Domingo Mora. And Domingo Mora comes to Perth Amboy from Uruguay um, in the uh, 1870s. And he just his designs are all over the town. So it's it's kind of interesting to, 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 to know that many of these designs are of Hispanic origin. Uh, and this also has if you look at the Washington statue itself, it, it's 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 an early use of white glazing to mimic marble. Uh, terracotta was one of the great imitators. You could glaze it to look like granite, to look like marble. Uh, this is. Yeah, this is an early example where that looks like a marble statue, but it's uh, it's just glazed that way. Um, other uh, throughout the county, um, we find other examples. This is in Roosevelt Park. Uh, this is a, a, a fountain uh, title uh, called Light Dispelling Darkness, which was um, sculpted by Wayland Gregory, who was a, an artist during the WPA era. Um, and it's a uh, it's kind of a bizarre sculptural piece. It's got this this globe on the top of the world um and then underneath the globe are um uh the sort of the positives of society it's science education and the artist thought here was that if like the the the, the good of the world came together it would dispel the evils of society and down on those arches kind of running into the uh into the water he sculpted the four horsemen of the apocalypse and he added two others um greed and materialism and this is a historic image of uh, the sculpture of war uh, being um, uh, being done. These were fired at Atlantic uh, terracotta. Uh, this is it today. Currently, it's this just bizarre thing of a Roman soldier with a World War One gas mask uh, and this wonderful shield with a skull on it. Um, you know, again showing one of the the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Uh, but this was done in 1937 um, with. Uh, uh, terracotta and just some it was a, it was a WPA story. project and light dispelling darkness was originally conceived to honor Thomas Edison and the light bulb but Gregory comes up with his own idea and says this is what I'm going to do as Mark had described the light dispelling darkness all these evils the horsemen of the apocalypse uh, apocalypse greed disease uh, it, it's all within that sculpture and just a, a little bit of a hint Mark and I'm sorry to stomp on your parade it needs a little restoration it does <laughs> it does uh, I'll tell you I oversaw the restoration of this probably about 15 years ago and uh, you're absolutely right it needs a uh, it needs um, some more work. Duly noted. Sorry <laughs> about that. <laughs> that's quite all right. Uh, 
Uh, and so we'll jump into another unique uh, subject when it comes to terracotta and ceramics, grave markers. In fact, Perth Amboy in Middlesex County probably has one of the largest collection of ceramic grave markers in the United States. Um, there are just hundreds of them uh, dating from the 1880s up through the early 20th century. Uh, this is one example. I believe this is an Alpine cemetery uh, in Perth Amboy from 1888. They also, again, speak to the immigrant groups that were working in these factories uh, whose loved ones had passed away and they they homemade many of these pieces for their loved ones. Um, and so you have the workers on one end, but also the owners. This is Carl Mathiasen, who was uh, president of Federal Seaboard Corporation um, and his mausoleum. The, the, the cladding on his mausoleum is made out of terracotta. This is in Metuchen in Hillside Cemetery. Uh, this is from Bruno Grandalis. This is from 1905. Uh, his father was a sculptor in one of the ceramic for, uh, companies there. Um, and uh, when um, his son died, uh, when Bruno died, he sculpted this life-size angel carrying his son out of this sarcophagus upwards towards heaven. Um, and on the back, it's, you know, it's signed, uh, uh, it's in Latin, it says, your father made this, uh, 1905. Other uh, examples are architectural elements meant for buildings, but reused as grave markers. And, you know, there are some great examples of that as well, uh, where workers are taking um, pieces uh, out of the factory, maybe they were discarded because they didn't fire right, and they sort of threw them away, uh, and then reincorporating them into uh, into a grave marker for a loved one that's passed on. Uh, and it just here's just some other examples. Uh, this one from the 1880s. You know, it almost looks like those flowers look like something you'd find on a wedding cake, right? I mean, it, it's the sort of detail you can only get with sculpting in clay. Other unique uses, these are terracotta bombs from World War I, they're practice bombs. Um, they were, uh, uh, many of the terracotta factories had government contracts to produce these, these terracotta practice bombs. They would put flour in them. Uh, there were fins that were put on the back and they were dropped out of airplanes. And when they hit the ground and broke apart, they would mark the spot and could be used as target practice. Uh, you can see a historic image of uh, them pressing the the uh, terracotta bombs. And then to the right, this was a cache of terracotta bombs that were found at the old uh, Federal Seaboard Company in Woodbridge. Um, they were used as an embankment, um, as part of an embankment along a rail line. Uh, and that's actually a photograph. I discovered these. Um, you can see their little noses sticking out. And I walked over and pulled one of them out of the embankment and, you know, was shocked to see that, you know, here was a, uh, uh, a practice bomb from World War I. Um, no other place do we know of our collection do we know that where they exist. Uh, you know, they were all used and broke apart and they've been found archeologically in fragments on other sites around the United States. But, um, uh, you know, these are some of the only complete examples. Middlesex County also has uh, records from the terracotta companies. Uh, we have a lot of job files. Uh, this is uh, a job file uh, from the 1950s for a city seal uh, for Boston. Um, you can see the drawing with all the, the glazing numbers on there. Um, they're the, uh, 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 they were saved by this gentleman, Stephen Kermondi, who was one of the last modelers with Federal Seaboard Terracotta Corporation. And when they closed, as John said earlier in 1968, uh, he took a lot of the files before they were destroyed. And thanks to him, uh, he saved a lot of the early records about the terracotta factories. Uh, he donated them to Middlesex County. We've digitized a lot of them and we have them on our um, our uh, public uh, site. And I'll give you the link so you can access that. So we get to the subject at hand, uh, the Anchor Cafe. And John, do you want to dive in here and uh, talk yeah, about its the history? The Anchor Cafe, uh, this particular building was built in 1905, although there's a symbol on the building. It's an anchor. The reason we call it the anchor because that was what it was named, but there's also an anchor on it. And the anchor says 1890, and then it says 1905. Well, 1905 is when this building was built. The 1890 uh, symbol is when actually they started their business. This was run by, um, initially, uh, the 
the, the saloon was just a half a block away from this particular building. In 1890, it was run by the Bartos family. And then um, Mrs. Bartos married into a Eastern European family. And they built this particular building. And that, this is what are, you see the 1890-1905 uh, symbol there. Uh, and it's a great piece of architectural terracotta. This was probably made at the New Jersey Terracotta Company off of Hall Avenue in Perth Amboy. It's very reminiscent of their style. Yeah, and uh, John, from the nomination that came in in 1890, uh, the current structure is from 1905. It was called... Let me just pull up the nomination form. It was called like the last life saving station. Yeah, that, that, that's correct. That was about a half a block away. Uh, and the what what that was out in the Raritan Bay, we have the Great Beds Lighthouse, and that's where the lighthouse men would stay above. And somewhere along the way in 1890, uh, a saloon starts there, and it was a watering hole for sailors. So this building, um, has was nominated uh and, has and, been... and by the way the s there is for the woman when she had remarried and i have her name here i'm gonna probably really mess up this pronunciation but it's uh shek verlikovsky um and that's where the s comes from and it was actually a a a, a lady who uh, was married into the family and she built uh she built the anchor So uh, a couple of things here. So for more information on the terracotta industry itself, uh, you can go to the uh, Middlesex County, nj.gov backslash history. Um, we have a monograph about the terracotta industry in, um, uh, in Middlesex County from a past exhibit that you can access online. And you can also access our online database and you can search keywords like terracotta, um, you know, whatever you want on there and see some of the things that we've digitized uh, to this, um, uh, you know, for this terracotta industry and other things that the uh, county has uh, as well. Um, I just want to close out before we go into um, some questions here. Uh, and I, I think I'll leave this image up here on the screen. Um, so this this was a threatened resource. All right. And um, uh you know, putting this in context of what we just talked about, you know, it makes this building so much more important because it's not just a single building. It's part of a story of Perth Amboy, of Middlesex County, of central New Jersey, of a very unique um, a ceramic history that that's ours, right? I mean, this is part of our, our New Jersey story, our ceramic history And you're story. absolutely correct, Mark. We have buildings just like the Anchor, all across Perth Amboy, dozens of buildings with architectural terracotta uh, as beautiful or even more beautiful than this. Yeah. And so uh, I do want to point out R Renee Skelton uh, from the Historic Preservation Commission, who couldn't be here, did send an email. Uh, and John, I'm sure you, you two can chime in about the, the current update. Um, it does seem as though like immediate demolition is off the table. They are. It looks like they're renovating the building, according to the email Renee sent. Um, she actually spoke with some workers who are. Well, um, that's right, Mark. The building was for sale. It was sold. It's for lease by a realtor. And I just drove by it yesterday and there's work being done on the inside. They're working on the electrical. They put in some new chandeliers within the building. So I believe the restaurant is going to reopen within that building. And I guess they're going to have to do some. Um, there's apartments above it. I think they're going to have to do some renovation to that as well. Right, and I'll close out uh, 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 with the Historic Preservation Commission is also looking to identify and create a architectural terracotta district. Right. Uh, in fact, the county has helped fund that um, and they have a nomination that's now uh, in review by the Historic Preservation Office. And this will help identify, you know, in totality what those buildings are and, you know, hopefully give more power to the HPC there. So, um, so thank you, John, M Melissa, thanks. Uh, and um, that's our outline of the architectural terracotta industry in the Anchor Cafe. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much. It's so fascinating to have all of that context because I often think, um, you know, we look at endangered sites in a vacuum, not understanding the 
full contextualized history. So it was really, really helpful. Thank you, Mark, um, and also John. So I will- You're, you're welcome. Just one more, one more thing, um, Liz, if, if you don't mind, sorry yeah. for the interruption. I, I'll show this here. It's for Columbus Day. It's a piece of terracotta tile that was made on the Eagleswood site in Perth, the Amboy. It's Christopher Columbus and made at party tile. You can see the, and a lot of uh, artistic tiles were also made in Perth Amboy uh, within different industries, uh, not specifically the one uh, that made the Anchor Cafe, but uh, um, party was one of those and um, other, other terracotta industries specialized in making uh, different types of artistic tile. So happy Columbus Day, by the way, or Indigenous Peoples Day. All right. Uh, you know, I don't even have to ask a question first because Evelyn has one ready to go in the chat. Evelyn asks, are the records of any of the terracotta companies preserved anywhere? So uh, Middlesex County has records from Federal Seaboard Terracotta Corporation. Many of them are post-war um, uh, time frame. Although as other companies went out of business, federal ended up with some of their records as well. So um, when Stephen Kermondi uh, salvaged what he could from Federal Seaboard uh, in Perth Amboy, included in there was Atlantic, New Jersey, Terracotta, some of the others as well. So that link I showed at the end will bring you to our website, which has more um, information. Columbia University also, uh, uh, their library there has uh, records of, uh, of some of the terracotta industries also. Thank we you. Also have, we also have records. Um, some of the uh, design books uh, are in various libraries and archives uh, for the Perth Amboy Terracotta Company, for the Excelsior Terracotta Company, for the New Jersey Terracotta Company. So we know where some of these pieces came from, but a lot, I would say the vast majority of the records are, are gone. To everyone else in the audience, you can type a question in the chat and I will gladly read it for you or you're welcome to unmute yourself and just go ahead and chime in. While we see if anyone else is typing up a question, I was wowed by the colors on some of the examples that you showed and um, forgive me, this might be a stupid question, but I always tell my students there are no stupid questions, so I'll have at it anyway. Do the colors need to be touched up or maintained in any way? So um, I what usually happens with terracotta is that it spalls. Um, the glazing itself tends to survive, uh, but the undercoating that's applied to it uh, sometimes spalls off or spalls uh, around. In fact, the, the Bruno Grandalis marker um, uh, one of the things that has come up about it is that if you polish the clay before you apply the glazing to a great extent, sometimes the glazing doesn't adhere to it quite well. And, and it's interesting with the Bruno Grandalis marker because it's so, like a lot of the glazing has come off on it. You kind of feel a father, like in commemoration for his, his young five-year-old son, like really taking the time, you know, to polish and clean this before the glazing was applied. Um, but, you know, to answer the question directly, I, I think usually what, what you find is that there's a, there's a spalling that will happen with the terracotta and the glazing will, will pop off. But, um, it, it is amazing with some of these buildings in those pieces, you know, being out in the elements for over a hundred years plus and that glazing, um, is, uh, is in remarkable shape. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody in the audience yet? All right, if you think of a question, go ahead and unmute yourself or type it in the chat. So John noted that there are so many examples of these terracotta buildings in Perth Amboy and that the anchor is one. So devil's advocate, someone might say, well, why do we need to save the anchor, right? Why, why do we need all of these examples? What would you say to someone who's arguing that, either Mark or John? 
Well, I think the anchor is one example out of many. And the reason that we we're concerned about the anchor, because the building was vacant for, for and actually still is vacant, uh, although they're doing work on the interior. So we we're very concerned. Uh, there's a lot of redevelopment going on in Perth Amboy. Um, condos and apartment buildings are in great demand. And we're seeing uh, older structures, many torn down, and uh, condos and apartment buildings going on top of them, uh, as well as warehouses and other um, redevelopment issues. So it becomes an issue uh, because we are so concerned that, you know, if we let a historic building be vacant for many years, uh, as we all know, that could be a very serious problem for vagrancy or a fire problem or, or just deterioration on a whole scale basis. Yeah. And, and to, um, absolutely agree with, with all that. Um, and, and I'll add the What's being looked at right now is a is a historic district, right? That's centered right. on the, uh, you know, these buildings, the the terror, the architectural terracotta. So, you know, it's looking at this in totality and how they all play off of one another. Um, so, you know, if you start to to demolish buildings out of that historic district, right? It's just it it, it vanishes. It's not there anymore. Um, so, I think it's you know, it's it's the it's the fact that you know these all survive in totality that makes this all important because they all contribute to the story. Great answer. That's that, now we know we're armed with that answer. If anybody says that, <laughs> now Matthew asks if the historic district in Perth Amboy comes to fruition, do you suspect it will require terracotta restoration or prevent removal of elements? I think it would prevent removal of terracotta. And we have had terracotta, believe it or not, stripped off of buildings and sold to architectural firms, let's say in Manhattan, uh, for quite a bit of money. And there was one building that just recently sold was a home with some gorgeous terracotta work that about 15 years ago was stripped off and sold. So hopefully we could prevent some of that from being done. And you have to realize too, when 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 you buy into a neighborhood, if especially if it's a residential neighborhood, you're buying into the history of that neighborhood and the beauty of that neighborhood and terracotta is part of that beauty. So, you know, why devalue your your own home uh, because somebody decides to strip off terracotta or or change a historic building? Yeah. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add to that. It, hopefully, too, what can come out of this is that, so currently the Historic Preservation Commission serves an advisory role. Um, and um, uh, in order to really, uh, you know, be effective, it, it needs to, um, uh, you know, move to the next level. So, you know, hopefully with the, the, the press from Preservation New Jersey, uh, with this latest work of, of submitting a, a National Register nomination to the HBO for, you know, an architectural terracotta district, hopefully it will raise a greater awareness of how valuable this is and to give the proper tools to the HBC so that they can go about um, regulating and maintaining it. And actually, Preservation New Jersey has raised awareness here in Perth Amboy by nominating it as the one of the top 10 endangered sites. Uh, I had a discussion with the mayor and some city council members recently, and they were talking about our historic value and our historic terracotta. So thank you, Preservation New Jersey. You can send them the recording of tonight's event as well. <laughs> <laughs> Let them know that we're still on the case. Um, do you, either of you gentlemen have an idea of the timeline uh, when you might hear something back about the uh, historic district nomination? Hmm. I'll leave that to you, Mark. Uh, yeah. Oh, so as I mentioned, Renee, who's from the Historic Preservation Commission, um, has been spearheading that, and the county helped fund uh, uh, the research for that. And and the email I got from her from earlier today was that uh, that it's been submitted. It's currently under review. Uh, so um, so I don't know exactly what the schedule is there, but uh, it's clearly something that we should be following through and helping to advocate um, uh, in that process. Okay, great. Other questions from the audience? All right, well, this has been great. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you, John. Um, we're so glad that we had the opportunity to help continue to shine, shine light on this historic resource and 
hopefully we hear good news about the historic district in the near future. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Remember, uh, we have our annual meeting at Monmouth University in West Long Branch this Saturday at 9. You can find all of our other information on social media or our website, preservationnewjersey.org. Mark, any last words? Uh, no, thank you again for helping to coordinate. And thanks for uh, the folks that uh, that have come on. Thank you. Thank awesome. you, John, too. John, any last okay, words? Uh, but my dog is barking. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we better let you go. <laughs> uh, so she, she's excited, and uh, I'm excited, and I thank Preservation New Jersey for your support of our rich birth family history. Thank you very much. Awesome. Everybody, have a great night, and we hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.